Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, we're going to wait for a few folks to get in, but if you can, let us know who you are and where you're coming from in the chat. It'd be great to get a sense of who's in the room. So thank you for joining, and we'll hopefully get started soon. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Meaningful Storytelling Skillshare. Uh, take a minute, please let us know who you are and where, you, where you're joining us from. Um, my name is Molly Greenberg. I'm with the Moving Forward Network. And while normally Felicia is moderating for us for our Skillshares, we've asked her this time to flip the script a bit for us and we'll be presenting um, and sharing with her, sharing with us her Skillshare about meaningful storytelling. So we're so glad everybody was able to come and I will turn it over to Felicia. Thanks, Molly. Um, we're gonna go ahead and get started then. I wanted to, before we officially start, uh, say welcome to those of you who are joining us and thank you for putting in the chat um, who you are and where you're located at this moment. So we've got uh, some folks in California, yay, home state, um, and hopefully some other folks too. We've got Kansas City in the house. Um, so if along the way, um, as we get started, you have interest in sharing and getting other folks to join in on this webinar to see it later. Please remember that all of our webinars are recorded. Um, we will be sharing the link to this recording with all of you who are joining us today. So you can share that link, forward it, rewatch it. Um, and anyone who registered or signed up for today's webinar and is unable to make it, um, we will also be sharing the recording with them as well. Finally, the recordings of all of these webinars will um, eventually be in the coming weeks located on the MFN YouTube channel. If you don't already subscribe to it or are aware of it, please see if you can find it, bookmark it, make sure that it is in your resources list because all of the webinars are there. There are six for this winter. There were three previous um, from earlier last spring uh, and summer. And there are other videos that MFN has created and will be creating. So please make sure that you bookmark and know about that MFN YouTube channel resource. So today, uh, it's true, as Molly said, I am not on the production side of helping people uh, share the skills and information and experiences that they have. Instead, I'm in front today to be able to share with you what I have learned um, and the experiences that I have had to be able to hopefully help y'all um, either tell individual stories um, or collective stories in the um, moments of your work in, in organizing on the front lines. So let's get started. Uh, there's a lot to uh, share and not a lot of time. So. You know, you usually uh, hear me only at the beginning and end for questions and introductions, but there's like many of us, right? There's a million things that we do. And sometimes we only share or only get uh, to see little bits of what it is that we do. So um, currently uh, I'm a narrative strategy consultant um, and I focus on personal storytelling for political power, um, formerly um, and sometimes. Uh, I'm a lecturer uh, here at the University of Nevada, Reno, which is where I'm currently located right now. 
Um, and I focus on uh, work that takes place in the gender, race, and identity department. And typically my classes are about um, representations of marginalized community members in pop culture and that influence on us and our lives and how we see the world and ourselves. Um, previous to that, I was the innovation director at the Center for Story-Based Strategy. We'll be hearing and reading and uh, being introduced or reminded of some story-based strategy content today. Then uh, previous to that, a lot of communications work and really at the heart of what I can say and proudly claim uh, in terms of what I am is I'm just a teacher, a trainer, a facilitator. Um, I was a teacher at Los Angeles Unified for 12 years uh, in the early aughts to 2012. And um, I, just a quick story, uh, how I got into teaching. Um, I was a student organizer uh, at UC Santa Barbara in the mid to late 90s. Um, after that, I got into community organizing after college. And from that moment in community organizing, I was defeated. I was working on a lot of California, um, California propositions and constantly on campaigns where we were losing, losing, losing. And I had taken some statistics classes as a social major, and I realized, how can I increase my odds of winning? <gasps> have more campaigns at once. So I went into teaching um, because I thought and treated every student as an individual organizing campaign. Um, so ultimately I had more wins and organizing isn't just something that happens in dedicated named organizing spaces as I know, we all know this. So um, any of the resources and information that I'm sharing today, um, if you wanna go down the rabbit hole and learn even more about how some of the information I'm sharing and tools that I'm sharing today can translate into other things, you can go to my website, FeliciaPerez.com, um, where you can see all other kinds of ways in which story-based strategy, um, education, and training all kind of happens in a particular way um, with some of the examples uh, in my portfolio that I share. So I have been doing work with Hand in Hand um, to help different individuals who are either care consumers or care providers tell their personal stories um, for moving legislation, both in California and with the Build Back Better Act. Um, I have done work uh, recently with the um, Institute for Sustainable Communities with their different uh, grantee cohorts to do what's called um, oral storytelling um, in an audio storytelling project. So I collect stories and I listen to the stories of people who are doing work on the ground, much like yourselves. Um, and then we edit that together and we share that out both to, you know, educate folks on what other folks are doing. Um, this particular project was at the Center of Climate and health um, solutions. And at the same time, we're also then collecting and archiving the stories of our elders and people who you know, are, are learning on the front lines about the work. Um, I also make games. I make card games because I feel like one way to actually learn and to continue to sort of practice, right? To get into the skill of practicing our imagination, of practicing and exercising our imagination muscles, our creativity muscles and our organizing muscles is through some sort of playful, fun repetition. So there is a game that I created called Game Changer. It's like apples to apples or cards against humanity, but instead of being about um, crass humor uh, or about learning vocabulary, which would be apples to apples, it's about learning about organizing tactics and really learning about what happens in all of those decider games is you're really focusing and exercising your muscles on audience, right? All of those kinds of card games like apples to apples and cards against humanity are about understanding and learning who the other players are so that when it's their turn to decide, they're picking your card. So you are being strategic about it, not based on what you want, but based on what's gonna move them to pick and select your card as the winner. So it's the same sort of thing oftentimes in organizing for direct action organizing and for communications work, right? That we're very specific and dialed in to the audience particularly that we're trying to move. Um, then there's also digital games that I've made. There's art. Um, if you've ever seen Barbecue Becky, if you've ever seen those memes and those images of this person who did the horrific uh, act of calling the police on black and brown bodies that were just trying to live their lives in a park in Oakland, California a few years ago. Um, and these images trying to bring out both the absurdity of what had happened and also some levity to the harm that had been done so that we could also heal and be sort of okay um, at some point with the healing of the after of that, but really calling attention to the absurdity of what they had done and the impact. Um, 
myself and, and another uh, fellow trainer in training, uh, Stephanie Colliar, uh, made those memes at that time as well. So these are ways that you can look into the website um, that I've put together so that you can kind of see how all of these can also um, come out and work. And that's where all the resources that I'll be sharing today are located as well. So what is this whole webinar about? Meaningful storytelling, what's that? Aren't all of our stories meaningful? Well, let's just make sure that strategically they are, that we are leaning into that, that, that is the goal. So meaningful storytelling, as I'm gonna be sharing it today, is the act of making the invisible visible via a strategic focus on the imagery and character use in a given story. So let's make our stories as meaningful as possible by selecting and deciding which images, which descriptions, and which characters should really be highlighted in our stories. That's the point. Um, and how can we use this for community power? Well, it actually stacks function. So on the one hand, it's for moving people, places, and things in a particular way to change their heart and minds into action, right? That we want people to either vote a certain way, we want people to act a certain way, we want people to maybe write or do something in a very particular way to move the needle, so to speak. But the other thing that being sort of strategic in the stories that we tell also helps with leadership development. It helps with archiving what it is that we are doing, the receipts collecting, if you will, and documenting a given problem or issue. We've had some recent webinars, right, on truck counts, Truck counts in and of itself, right, could be a part of meaningful storytelling, especially if it is part of leadership development, archiving the work as you're doing it, right? Like in the last webinar that we had, um, Odette from Cause was so just absolutely wonderful in showing these pictures in the webinar training of what the Truck Count Act is like, but it also in those pictures shows young people, shows black and brown people, shows folks like out in their community wearing masks, doing the work. Every single bit of the images are a part of the story that we are telling and conveying. And it doesn't matter what those images look like in terms of their quality. So never shy away from, oh, but we don't really have good cameras or all oh, our cell phones don't really take the best things or the video quality didn't come out great. What those different types of quality images and videos do is also help to tell the story of the authenticity that this really did come from folks on the ground versus it was this huge production value, right? Like every particular aspect of a story can be strategically used or not used or edited in a particular way. So take all the pictures, collect all of the videos of your work and of the actual areas and spaces that you're talking about and collect things that maybe you also think aren't useful at all. And we'll get to that in some of the examples that I'll be sharing. So let's go over something really quick, stories and narratives. Oftentimes, and especially of the last maybe eight, 10 years, we hear a lot about story and narrative, story and narrative, and they're sort of used interchangeably but let's just make sure that we kind of get how they work, right? So this is a great image um, resource that came from the Narrative Initiative. If you haven't heard from them, they might be of interest for you to check out. And basically what this image is trying to say is that narratives are made up of messages and stories, right? So enough messages and enough stories will create a narrative, builds up to that. And why are narratives so important? What do they have that is so powerful? Well, they have the power to affect and influence our values and our worldviews, right? So if you get enough messages and stories about beauty, about who and what is beautiful, enough of those messages and stories will create a narrative that beauty might look like a certain skin color, a certain body size, a certain hair color, a certain level of uh, body ability and accessibility, and those narratives that that's what beauty is, then affects what we value, who we value, and how we value it, and how we then see the world, right? So it could be on beauty, it could be related to racial issues, it could be related to what we think and believe and what our world view or value is of uh, police, of the military, of the government, of any single thing, right? Enough messages and stories, that critical mass creates a narrative. That narrative then affects our values and worldviews. So the power of story essentially looks like this repeated video 
in this gif or gif that we have here, right? That stories, no matter how small, can actually have the power as they build up to knock down some of the largest narratives and some of the largest worldviews. It is possible to change our values and our worldviews one small story at a time. So with that being said, we're gonna go over some things now that are from my old workplace, the Center for Story-Based Strategy, right? So at the Center for Story-Based Strategy, we tend to start our trainings with a lot of quotes and a lot of images and questions. For the sake of time, I'm gonna kind of go through them rather quickly. So one of the main quotes that we use at the Center for Story-Based Strategy is this one by Wayne Dyer that says, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. That's the point of meaningful storytelling. That's the point of story-based strategy and being strategic in the way that we share our stories. We want to change the way our audiences look at things so that from here on out, they are always looking at things differently because of the way that we opened up that world view, right? So one of the first images that we show is this. And we just ask, if you look up at the night sky, what would you see? What is this an image of? Inevitably, someone will say, oh, wait, wait, I know this, I know this. Um, that's the Big Dipper. Then we'll get somebody who says, oh, it's, it's Ursa Majora, isn't it? They get, you know, big terms, Ursa Majora, what's that? Big Dipper, I get that. But Big Dipper, are we talking about a spoon then, right? So is there, in fact, though, a big spoon or ladle in the sky? Like when you look up, is that, is that actually a spoon that we're seeing? Not, right? Like there is no spoon in the sky, but we use this as a story to impart that remembrance that when you look up at the sky and you see this connection of stars, that's the Big Dipper. And we share this on and on so that we can then start to look at the sky and make meaning of things, right? So we have this phrase here from the founders of the Center for Story-Based Strategies book, called Reimagining Change. And the quote is, the currency of narrative is meaning, not truth, right? So when we tell the story of looking up at the sky and that there is this big dipper, there is a spoon there, that's not true, but it's meaningful enough to stick. And then we keep that with us. Oh, that's a spoon, that's a spoon. Well, it's the big dipper. Well, it's this constellation of stars, right? So the meaning is how we remember facts. Meaning is how we remember information, even if that information may not be true. For example, let's keep going with this. There's a phrase that became popular over the last few months for some people, and the phrase is, let's go, Brandon. Now, it is a phrase that has nothing to do with someone named Brandon, correct? We know that the phrase now, let's go Brandon, is a stand-in for saying F you Joe Biden, right? The story goes that there was a sort of like news moment. There's a newscaster explaining that there are some folks um, in the back chanting and the other newscaster in the uh, sort of home channel in the studio says, what are they yelling? And the news reporter in front says, um, I think they're yelling, let's go Brandon because on the air, they couldn't say F you Joe Biden. So now the right and supporters of the former president have decided to make bumper stickers and t-shirts and to just chant, let's go Brandon, even though that is not the truth about what is happening in those areas and spaces. It's meaningful to them. And so they remember it and they keep passing it on. But the important things about meaning is that they only mean something to a particular group of people, right? And that meaning can change over time. Meaning is culturally specific. It's geographic specific. It's age, gender, everything specific. So let's go, Brandon, isn't going to mean anything to just everyone. Much like there was a time where just seeing a bicycle or a scooter just hanging out on the corner would communicate to us, um, did somebody leave that? Is that gonna get, is that gonna get stolen? Um, what happened to everyone that there's just bikes everywhere and scooters just thrown on the sidewalk? Now we know that whether we like it or not, 
to mean that those are rentable, those are birds, those are different sort of, you know, company commodified, you know, things that you could pay a particular amount of money to be able to use. Then we go to the red hat. The red hat doesn't have a meeting any place else in the world except for areas that know about the former president and the way in which they branded in their campaign a red hat with particular words on it. But you don't even need to see the words on it anymore to see a red hat and have a particular meaning that triggers and gets you to think about a particular story, particular narratives, particular values, particular worldviews. And lastly, let's look at the mask, right? How many of us were, if we saw someone wearing a face mask before March 2019, 2020, right? How many of you before the beginning of the pandemic had particular values and worldviews and interpretations about someone you saw wearing the face mask outside of a hospital or medical facility, right? And now there is a different meaning if you are wearing a mask, if you aren't wearing a mask out in public, and if it's maybe just below the nose, right? Okay. All these things are important because meaning has to be significant to you or has to be significant to the audience that you're trying to move because that meaning then gives them a purpose. There's a reason for doing something. It is that meaning. And that reason for and purpose for doing things is going to have an impact. And that impact has the meaning and the meaning has the purpose. And it just goes around and around in circles. So maybe stories are just data with a soul, says sociologist Brene Brown. So how do we take data, whether it's from a truck count or it's from an air monitoring uh, series of work that we're doing, or it's from door knocking door to door and getting intake from folks about their needs or issues or things that are relevant and important to them. How do we take data ever and pretty much infuse it with the soul to make it a meaningful story that might move a particular person or audience into a particular kind of action? And more importantly, some of this has to do with a concept called framing. Now, we started out talking about the Big Dipper, right? These, this constellation in the sky. But the Big Dipper, it turns out, is only one little part of a much larger constellation, that Ursa Major, that really has nothing to do with a spoon. It's a bear, right? So if you expand and frame with a wider angle, you might have a completely different story and a completely different meaning and a completely different way to view the sky and to tell that story. So how do we know which part of the story to share? Well, we're gonna be talking right now about Western stories and storytelling. So this is the way that stories can be effective if you are trying to change folks who are used to stories that are pretty much put together in the tradition of Western storytelling. So this is earned media. This is how newspapers and journalists put together their stories. This is how most of our pop culture in the West is put together. These are the elements of story that should be there in order to move people into action. There are five of them. Number one is conflict. Your story has to have a conflict or sometimes we call it the point. You know how sometimes you're listening to someone tell a story and it's a lot of detail, you're like, uh-huh, uh-huh, oh, okay. And you really want to get to that and then, right? Because you want to ask, and then what? Like, what is the point of this story? The conflict lets you know as a listener, as a consumer, as the audience of that story, what choice you have to make. There was either this or there was either that. And oftentimes it's framed just like that, this versus this. You can look at several different newspaper articles or even uh, television news reports and they'll say it's blank versus blank, right? And that is literally how they are framing the conflict in that story that they're telling. So you wanna know who is it between, what's at stake, what's the point? Next, you need to have characters in your story. And the characters don't have to be people. You can personify things. How many times have you seen something where it's a video, a story, a song even, where the character is an object, or the character is some other kind of animal that is there as a metaphor to talk about a person. So these are the messengers in the story. And it's important to determine too, are our characters gonna tell the story for themselves? Or is someone gonna speak for them? 
So these are all things that are super important. And also in the characters that you have in your story, how are they being cast or portrayed or shown? Are they being shown or portrayed as the hero? Are they being shown or portrayed as the villain? Are they being shown or portrayed as the victim? Or are those kinds of portrayals not even there at all? And so this is how, right, when we're looking at those characters, it's important to also consider how are we showing them? Because oftentimes if we don't think about that, we might be showing our hero as if they're a, a, a victim and only that, right? So also within these three, you could have multiple, you could have a character in your story that passes through all three of these portrayals. It really is up to you and it's based on what it is that you're trying to communicate. Next, we have imagery. These are about what are you visually showing and what are the images that come to mind? Oftentimes that's the part that we miss. And if we don't think about that, then we might also be communicating something different. So make sure that the images that you show are meaningful enough and that they are triggering the right kind of imagery response in our mind, right? So just looking at this logo or icon for imagery, it's of mountains, with the sun and some forest. If you have been to those kinds of spaces and that is calming to you and makes you feel at peace, then seeing that kind of imagery might then trigger you to think of those nice, great, fun times that you have had with something similar to that. But let's say you do not have a good time outside and really horrible or hurtful, harmful things happen to you. This seeing this image might conjure up all of that in terms of the memories in your mind, and that might not be what we want. So we need to know who our audience are way more than we need to focus on this first. So who is your audience? What ages are they? Uh, what do they like to eat? What have they been watching lately? What are their favorite colors? Um, who do they hang out with? What languages do they speak? What kinds of bodies do they have? Do they require any kind of uh, assistance in order to just exist in the world? You need to know all about that in terms of who you're trying to move so that all of these things are particular to them. Next, we have foreshadowing. So foreshadowing is always in stories too. It's that thing, that either image or that sound or that one little bit that foreshadows and lets us know what is possibly gonna happen next at the end of this story or later in the story, right? What positive outcome might there be or what negative outcome that might be? And sometimes the foreshadowing is silence. Sometimes the foreshadowing is sound related, right? A lot of times foreshadowing can be really successfully shared if you have the ability to use sound right? The sound of things crashing, the sounds of things coming, the sound of waves, the sound of buildings being created all the time, the sounds of trucks on the freeways all the time, or the sound of idling big trucks in our neighborhoods. Recording things and imagery sometimes also comes from sound. Though sound isn't an image, it can create images and give us that foreshadowing of what's to come assumptions, underlying assumptions. This is one of the most important parts of our storytelling and strategic use of it. Underlying assumptions are the unstated assumptions in the story. They are what someone has to believe in order to believe that the story is true. So it also essentially is the values that are reflected in the story. The stories I'm gonna be sharing with you later today are about me being chronically ill. Now, if you look at me and you look at my portfolio and you look at me on these webinars, you might have no idea that I am not well. Now, when I do then share the story about not being well in terms of health, will you believe it? You'll only believe it if you could believe that someone could be sick and still function in the world. If you don't believe that, then it doesn't matter what I tell you. For example, if your audience that you're trying to move doesn't believe that you are educated, are an expert, are knowledgeable, or are from that particular neighborhood and area and community that you speak of, 
it doesn't matter what you say. Also, if you're sharing new information with someone that they have never heard before, that would seem unbelievable, how do you then kind of get to that middle road? Do you change who the messenger is? Do you change what you say or how you say it? Yes. And let's get to the how. So these are those five elements of story that if you're trying to tell a story to change someone's heart and mind into meaningful action, they have to have these five things in them. So check your stories, check the things you've already been sharing, check the images that you're just posting on social media, because those are communicating a story as well. Do they have these five things? Are these five things there? And are they clear? Next, we get to framing. Framing is what you strategically decide to leave in and leave out of a particular story. This, for example, is a picture of the Taj Mahal. Look at what's in this photo. We've got some people walking up some stairs with a beautiful building. We have this, um, you know, walking uh, entrance area with this reflective uh, pond here. But this is also a picture of the Taj Mahal. No people, soccer ball, some sort of, you know, trash. There's definitely water, doesn't look the same. Now, which picture is better? The answer is, well, it depends. What are we trying to do with these pictures? Who are we trying to move with these pictures? And what would move them? So you know I'm chronically ill. If I was trying to tell my family, I need your help and support financially and emotionally to go to the Taj Mahal. I've always wanted to go to the Taj Mahal. Um, I know I'm not, I don't have the best immune system, but I promise family I'll be safe when I go. Which picture do you think I should use in that email to gain support? Mm, maybe the one on the left. Or if I was trying to convince my family, friends and community to support me financially and emotionally for going to the Taj Mahal, maybe I could say, you all know it's super important for me to do what I can with my life and my time, things that are meaningful and important to me that make a difference in other people's lives. I need to go to the Taj Mahal because there is important work for me to do there. It is needed. Which picture might I show then? The one on the left or the one on the right? Again, depending on what will move your audience, that is what determines how you frame and what you say. Framing isn't just in images though. Framing can be in language and how we describe someone's actions. And that framing has life consequences. The way we frame things can help someone live or die. So these are two images from Hurricane Katrina in 2005. On the left, we have the description of the image underneath. It says, caption, a young man walks through chest deep flood water after looting a grocery store in New Orleans on Tuesday, August 30th, 2005. Looting communicates that this was illegal, that this was not something that is sanctioned by the law, and that if police are then sent out, that there is support for potential state sanctioned violence. On the right, we have very different people. They are not uh, in black bodies with dark skin, right? We've got two white folks who are finding, the caption, two residents wade through chest deep water after finding bread and soda from a local grocery store after Hurricane Katrina came through the area in New Orleans. Looting versus finding. Framing changes the reaction of the audience. Here we have the description of where families were being separated at the southern border between Mexico and the United States. We've got a particular news channel and a host, Laura Ingram from Fox News, calling the uh, tent cities where kids are being placed, summer camps. And on the right-hand side, uh, towards the bottom, we then have Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, then sharing as well. Um, AOC calls migrant detention centers concentration camps. Now remember, concentration camps gives you the imagery of a different historical moment, foreshadowing we know how that story ends. Summer camps. 
You get imagery of a particular kind of location and activities that would happen there, foreshadowing what would then happen there. Both of these ways frame the same stories differently, give them different meaning so that it sticks differently. There are underlying assumptions here as well. You would never maybe believe anything from someone on Fox News. Then it doesn't matter what Laura Ingram says. Or you might be someone who never believes anything that AOC and the squad might say. So it doesn't matter what they say either. So we've learning here that there's actually quite a lot of power here in our senses and our sensory experience and the imagery that we can show or conjure up in our audience's minds. So this takes us to a new quote by Barbara Green. If you tell me it's an essay, but if you show me it's a story, you can still show and have imagery in stories that just have words, just like a lot of words can come from just one image. So we call these memes. Uh, the Center for the Story-Based Strategy used to be called Smart Meme. And this is how stories actually travel. Remember those images I showed you before of the red hat and the mask, right? Those are memes. These are also memes, by the way, but these aren't quite the memes that we're talking about. We're mostly talking about the memes that are kind of so woven into the fabric of our lives, they are to the point of invisibility. So for example, we have this image of the candles. If you saw candles lit on a cake, would you think that somebody died? Would you think that somebody just recently retired? What if you heard this song? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Birthday song, right? So that is a meme, the song, the candles is a meme. We have the phrase from Occupy um, times in the past, right? Like we are the 99%. That 99% became something of meaning to explain the haves and the have nots, right? But this meaning isn't gonna work for everyone, right? If I say the 99%, my mom's like, you mean the 99 cent store? So the meaning has to be there for the audience that you're trying to move. Next, we have the peace sign. Did you know that the peace sign is actually two military flags of letters? The N, which is a circle with the up and down. The P, which is the circle with a line down the middle. The peace sign actually is supposed to stand for nuclear disarmament. So tearing down the weapons, taking them out of you know, countries' hands and power, not necessarily just this. Then we have the unity clap. The unity clap is a meme, right? That clap that begins rather slow and loud and builds in its volume and builds in how fast, right? And we all kind of start together coming from the United Farm Workers, both Mexican and uh, Filipino farm workers and workers coming together to show that unity. That clap has that in it as a meme as well. Colin Kaepernick kneeling, kneeling at that gesture of during the time that the national anthem is played in the United States has that meaning of support and recognition of state-sanctioned violence against black and brown bodies. And then much of reaction to these things is those new takes on the flag of the United States with no color except for one stripe. One stripe might be blue for blue lives matter, the police, or that stripe might be red for the fire department, right? So all these things have meaning to them and they are the triggers, the dog whistles, the ways to communicate, the lights, the beacons, the flashes for particular audiences to move in particular ways. So the other effects of show don't tell, right? Like there's a, a space called sketch plantations and they will sketch out and visualize and create imagery for particular facts, information and details. So this is the curb cut effect. This is trying to show don't tell how many people benefit from that cut in the curb, that's called the curb cut, right? So it isn't just for folks who use wheelchairs. People benefit from it all the time. If you have a stroller, if you are a delivery person, if you have luggage, if you're on a bike, there are so many different moments um, in which the curb cut is beneficial. If you've injured yourself or you have a, a long-term disability where you sometimes are often use a cane or a walker, right? There are many people who benefit from the curb cut. And this image is highlighting where there are wheels and the beneficiaries, right? But while we're here on symbols, 
there's a way that you can change memes and change logos and change imagery to also communicate something different. So let's look at these different changes in the symbol for the accessibility icon. We have the traditional one being someone in a wheelchair side profile, but notice they're not moving. It's almost as if that's for the person who's moving them, but that's not actually how all of this works in terms of the community of folks who do use wheelchairs. So there's an update to the icon that shows that activeness, that engagement, that independence, if you will. And there's all these different reasons why it's time to actually change it, right? The original one is from 1968. Things are changing. We want to communicate something different. It's time to maybe change that image. So now let me show you how all of this can work, right? If you are trying to communicate a particular story, oftentimes we do it with one person's story at a time to then create that larger critical mass of a narrative that then can change worldviews and values, right? So tell your story to change the story, that larger narrative story. So story goals, right? Basically, goals of telling the story are twofold. One, they expose what's happening. We tell the story so that folks can know what's going on and that there's a choice to make. The second reason that we tell stories is to share what could happen if we transformed. That's where the foreshadowing comes in, right? So number one, let's tell what's happening. And two, let's tell what could happen, negative or positive, depending on people's actions. And so with that in mind, I've created um, a sort of curriculum to help folks tell their story, depending on what they're trying to do. What is the intent? There are organizing stories, there are mobilizing stories, and there are advocacy stories. I'm gonna show you the process of creating from one person's story, three different versions of it, three different versions of text and three different versions of images. What are these three different versions all about? An organizing story are stories that connect individuals and build relationships. So they might be very long. They're in depth, uh, a memoir, right? Um, so Alicia Garza's uh, book, um, Patrice Cullors' book, um, Maria Hinojosa's book, those are organizing books because they are long, they are in-depth, and organizing is about relationship building. The other way that you could tell a story is for mobilizing purposes. Mobilizing purposes, these are stories that you are trying to essentially motivate folks to take a particular action, and you want a lot of people to take that action. So it might not be such an in-depth story, it's going to be a story, though, that's going to be very detailed on what people can do. And there's a key word that you need to use if you have a mobilizing story. And that key word is the word because. Lots of different psychological and social research has shown, if you can believe it, that just using the word because creates that trigger that there's a reason and I need to get behind that reason. Third reason or way to use storytelling for change is to use it for advocacy. These are stories that influence decisions, decisions of an individual person, decisions of a group. So you're gonna tell an advocacy story if it's a story for city council, for um, individual voters, right? And those stories are gonna be very personal about them, right? So it's gonna take on a different sort of take. Organizing stories, mobilizing stories, advocacy. Organizing, relationship building. These are long, deep, detailed stories. Mobilizing stories, very short, mostly focused on the word because and what's the action that you want people to take. And advocacy, you want people to be compelled to tell your story again and again and again to build that momentum. So these are the three different kinds of stories that you might tell. The organizing story will always end with a question. All three stories ends with a question. The organizing story ends with, how about you? What's your story? Remember, this is about relationship building. The mobilizing story ends with, so will you come to the next meeting? Will you donate? Because you want to ask the question, will you participate? And then the third version of the story, an advocacy story, is going to end with, can I count on your support? Can we count on your vote for said issue? Every story ends with a question. So now uh, let me share one particular story. And then we'll have a very limited amount of time for questions, um, but we do still plan to have them. Okay, here we go. 
Um, share your story, that data with a soul so that it can provide a window or a mirror for your intended audience. That's what you want to do. So if it's folks who don't know anything about your issue, you want to tell them a kind of story that lets them in. If you're going to tell a story where you're trying to actually have people see themselves, maybe the audience already knows a little bit of what you're talking about, then you're gonna to wanna to tell a story where they see themselves. Okay, this is my organizing story. My organizing story is long. The organizing story is to get you to understand that one in seven people have a chronic illness. One in seven people. I am one in seven. So I love to plank. Planking is my thing. Um, it was something that really was popular in 2011. It is not 2011, and I still do it. Um, and planking, the idea is you're going to lay down on the ground and be as stiff like a wooden plank, a plank of wood. That's the idea. Um, but I've been known as the international plankster. I plank everywhere. Um, this is uh, Athens, Greece. Um, that's Nogales, Mexico. Uh, that is uh, Disneyland. It's Star Wars, um, Meow Wolf. You name it, I've planked it. This is probably my best plank. Um, I mean, just look at it, the, the colors getting up to the tree, just that whole plank thing. But there's a little foreshadowing in this image. As you can see, there's a table there, which gives you an idea that maybe I didn't just magically jump up there. And actually, some of the best planks are, you know, planks that require other people. And stories and planks rarely are solo acts. So this is actually how I did it. Now, which is the better picture to show? This one or this one? Again, it depends on what I'm trying to communicate and who I'm trying to move. If I'm trying to say that anything is possible, you just have to set your mind to it. Or anything is possible if you ask for help and you let your community help you, right? So it depends. Again, framing, framing, framing. But why do I plank at all? Why plank in all of these places? Well, it's kind of a balancing act. I plank because when I'm not planking, I'm getting my chemo on. I've had 58 fusions of chemo over the last 10 years, and it can be exhausting. And these are the pictures I take when I'm at chemo. And I have just as many pictures of being at chemo as I have planking. In fact, we're almost at a, at a dead heat. If you look behind me up here, these are all my favorite planks. So how did I get here? How did I get to planks and chemo? Well, uh, that's a longer story. I was a teacher, as I mentioned, in Los Angeles for 10 years and a very active uh, teacher. Some of my students are now doctors, um, graduates from different colleges all across the country. Um, and they're great human beings and they're actually old now and they have families and they are parents. And when I was their teacher, I would have in my classroom behind my desk pictures of me through the ages that I was teaching. So when I taught ninth graders, I had my ninth grade picture up. When I taught 10th graders, 12th graders, I had pictures of me up and I did that because I wanted my students to remember that I too was their age. And I needed to remember that I too was their age. So when my students were driving me nuts, I would turn around, look at the age that I was and be like, yep, that's about right. That's what they should be doing, right? So this was the way to communicate that. So in 2012, I left California and I moved to Reno, Nevada because I got married and my partner moved here for work and I kind of liked them. So we kept uh, staying together and moving along. And within a month of moving to a whole new state in town, I had this sort of like headache all the time and my eyelid would droop down a lot um, and I didn't know what was wrong. And I go to the eye doctor, gives me ointments, gives me eye drops and then says, oh, those aren't working. I think you might have a brain tumor. So I get my first MRI. I've had 25 since. I've had 11 rounds of radiation to my eye and brain, um, chemo ongoing, you name it. And every time, this is how I spend most of my year, um, eight to 12 sessions of chemo per year. And so what do I do now? Like I, I can't safely be in a classroom, not reliable in that particular sort of way to be on my feet and in front of a space all the time. So teaching looks slightly different. Instead of being with a big group of students, that's us in the dugout, uh, dugout of Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles. Now I teach people in a different sort of way in smaller spurts of energy. And that's me with um, the amazing group, the Dream Defenders out of Florida. And so again, one in seven Americans has a chronic illness and I am one in seven. 
And this is the art that I make about the struggle to be chronically ill in the United States to help people understand what it is like. It's as if I'm not just married to my partner, we have a third person in our relationship and that is the chronic illness that continues to just hearken and make things so much more challenging and difficult during this time with COVID. But what I do with the things that I have to pay for and use in order to keep my body safe is I make art to have that art be the imagery that tells the story of the kind of work that we do. And so that is the organizing story. And I would end it by saying, so what's your story? How about you? And what I did in creating this sort of like methodology of putting this all together is I have these, these texts that you can then start to put together your own story and see how parts of the story have changed and what I add in it for different kinds of stories that I'm going to tell. When I was telling a mobilizing story to try and get funding for some of the medical costs, again, the story was different. Look at this image here. It's not of the pill bottles. It's not of me planking. It's a receipt, right? So we've talked lately about like, ooh, you know, give them the receipts. You know, like, ooh, we've got receipts. Literal receipts can be helpful as well to show and tell the story of the cost of things. Do not throw anything away. And the GoFundMe um, mobilizing story had that specific ask. And as written over here on the right-hand side, you can see I've highlighted the word because, right? So the last phrase of this story that was written on my GoFundMe page says, any and all donations will go towards our $7,800 yearly out-of-pocket costs and to expenses that help in the healing process, including chiropractic and acupuncture visits. Donate whatever you can and please share this far and wide because we all deserve to live in age with dignity by any means necessary, right? So you've got these different details, the mobilizing. Then you've got the advocacy story. I'm gonna show you two quick videos and then that probably leave us with five uh, minutes of questions and I'll be around to answer some more for a little bit longer than our hour time. So the advocacy question, can we count on your vote? It started actually with me just responding to a post that was on Facebook that said, you know, would you have any, um, you know, uh, issues if the Affordable Care Act um, was no longer here? I wrote my answer. Next thing I know, I get a phone call. There's a write up and there's a video. My pre-existing condition was hopeful. My pre-existing condition was free. My pre-existing condition was feeling that I had all the opportunities to stay alive. Two weeks ago, I just finished my 35th infusion of rituximab. I can now see some distance between me and death. And then I watch the news. The Trump administration surprised a lot of people today with a move to obliterate Obamacare. If successful, over 20 million people will lose their health care and protections for people with pre-existing conditions. 130 million people with pre-existing conditions. Republicans will always protect Americans with pre-existing conditions. We protect you. There are words and there are actions. And when you put those together, they tell the whole story. So do I trust the president? It's really hard to have hope when people are talking about things they're going to do, but their actions are in deep contradiction with those things. Hearing about the Affordable Care Act no longer existing means everything that I'm doing to get better might not be enough. And that actually my life is in the hands of people who I do not know, who do not know me, who are essentially telling me that I don't matter, that my life doesn't matter, that my health doesn't matter, that my day-to-day -day quality of life doesn't matter. And um, that's really hard. We need to tell the stories of all the different kinds of ways in which the Affordable Care Act affects us because it's in sharing about what's happening in our lives that people realize there are more people in the United States impacted by this than we ever see. How else will maybe my representatives hear my story? If they're not coming to me, I have to come to them in any and every way possible. There was a lot going on in that story and I share it with you because there were so many details that we had to consider when putting that together. Number one, did you hear sound? 
did you hear sound at the beginning? It was kind of like, duh, 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 duh. and then towards the end, it was like this sort of momentum, like a Hollywood trailer story about like, you know, bravery, right? Those things are in there by design. They are characters in the story to provide imagery. Now I decided to do that PSA commercial because I never saw people who looked like me in any of these types of commercials. I didn't see people who were heavily tattooed, shaved head, brown, queer, in loving relationships, and sad. I didn't see any of those. those wasn't, that wasn't a mirror that I ever saw. And I felt like I had to be willing to share that story to provide that window and that mirror for others like me and my family. This then translated to a different advocacy story that happened very recently. This was the advocacy story, but um, I never speak. You'll never hear me talk at all. Instead, someone is using my words and they sound a little bit different. Now, when Kamala Harris's office, then Senator, asked me for a picture, these are the three sets of pictures that I sent them. One where I'm wearing a mask. They didn't like that one. One where it tells a story of all those different treatments that I've had. They didn't like that one either. They went with the third one. Now let's imagine, why would they go with the third one? Advocacy usually needs hope. They need to show that it's possible for a different outcome to exist. This is the only one where very large is sort of a smile and that's it, framing. Here's that story and what that sounded like. Senator Harris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, I wanna extend greetings to Judge Barrett and uh, I look forward to our conversation this evening. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Thank you. Uh, before I begin, I, I want to just take a moment to talk directly with the American people uh, about where we are and how we got here. So we are in the middle of a deadly pandemic that has hit our country harder than any other country in the world. More than 215,000 of our fellow Americans have died and millions more, including the president, Republican members of this committee and more than 100 frontline workers here at the Capitol complex have been infected. This pandemic has led to an historic economic crisis, causing millions of workers to lose their jobs without warning, and 12 million Americans have lost their employer-based health insurance. The Senate, I strongly believe, must be and needs to be laser focused on you, the American people, to help you get through this pandemic. To do so, the Senate urgently needs to pass critical financial relief for those who are struggling because of this pandemic, and many are struggling. People need help. They need help to pay their rent or mortgage. Parents need help putting food on the table. The millions of American workers who have lost their jobs need help making it through the end of the month. And small businesses need help so they don't have to close their doors for good. But sadly, Senate Republicans have rushed to hold this Supreme Court confirmation hearing rather than help those who are suffering. So as you can see, there's nothing about me being said at all, but there's my picture in the background. And eventually Senator Harris, uh, then Senator Harris will eventually uh, talk about me, and this is what they will say. I said earlier today that the people who will lose health care are somehow not relevant to this hearing. I disagree. Helping these people is supposed to be why we are all here, why we all ran for office in the first place. And I'm here to fight for people like Felicia Perez. And this is her. Felicia is a writer, a public speaker, and former high school teacher from Southern California who now teaches at the University of Nevada, Reno. She has multiple pre existing conditions, including arthritis, asthma, and a rare autoimmune disorder that caused tumors that have wrapped around her optic nerve and part of her brain. Her life depends on periodic cancer-fighting infusions that cost $160,000 a year. Felicia is terrified. She knows that without the Affordable Care Act, she could not afford ongoing treatment. 
the treatment she needs to stay alive. So for the sake of time, I'm going to fast forward to, you know, right before this moment, um, I was supposed to be going to Washington DC where I was going to deliver and share with each of the representatives, these art pieces that I had made um, that have mirrors on the bottom of the pill bottles so that folks would have that perspective and that idea in mind. Um, again, the goals of telling all of these stories for myself was to expose what living with a chronic illness is like and what should happen or could happen rather if the Affordable Care Act um, was no longer. You can see afterwards framing again how the actual Supreme Court decision to keep the Affordable Care Act was framed in the news. CNN says Supreme Court dismisses challenge to Affordable Care Act, leaving it in place, whereas Fox News framed it as the Supreme Court upholds Obamacare law, dismissing challenge from red states. The use of the word Obamacare versus the Affordable Care Act, which is the actual name of the law, is that framing and is that meme and is that part. So ways to put one story together in multiple different ways for different purposes are all on um, uh, my website under resources and there are other resources there as well. I'm sorry our time went over. Um, here are some things in summary that stories and messages create narratives and those narratives create worldviews and values. Make sure that your stories that are made to change people's hearts and minds have those five different critical elements. Make sure that your characters are easily identifiable as either being the villain, the victim, or the hero in your given story. Be strategic about what you're collecting, what you're using to show and tell the story of your work and the issue. And remember that no story is too small to change a larger narrative. So I'm going to stop there. And I know we went over, but let's see if there are any questions that I can answer and I can stay for a few minutes just in case. Thanks, Molly. Let's see. Boop, boop, boop. We have one question. Um, can you have access to the templates? Yes. So if you go on to the website, um, feliciaperez.com, and you go to resources at the very bottom is uh, two documents. One is a uh, Microsoft Word template for you to start to put in the details of your story, as well as a PDF document that shows you how I've translated my story into those three different kinds of stories. So you can see those side by side, one that you can start filling out and one that gives you as a guide. Um, so those are there as well. Um, I have a question here, let's see. Uh, often our targets are politicians who seem disconnected from the stories and expertise from the community. Are there ways or recommendations on how to apply the storytelling skills to public comment? Absolutely, you need to have that visual, right? So if you have public comments, can you have an item that someone has to look at that they will then attach to the story that you tell, right? So behind me, right, I've got these things that look like eyes. Um, I have the pill bottle glasses. This is what I was gonna leave at all of the politicians' offices on my visit to them, right? It was to tell my story and to say, here, I have this for you. I'd like for you to have it so that you remember me. And in fact, there was a representative um, from Southern California um, who recently was talking about the costs of drug prices and she was wearing earrings that had the little vials from the COVID um, vaccination uh, medicine, right? So there are ways in which you can leave specific items or bring up items. We have moments where folks are talking about the effects of air and they have asthma or family members have asthma and they bring in all of their inhalers and medical devices for the asthma because those things might be identifiable with the folks who were trying to move. So who doesn't know what a pill bottle looks like? But what a pill bottle looks like for me, because I have hundreds, is different than the just regular everyday ones that we have. So that physical image element that you can bring into the public comment and leave with them, leave it either in their mind or physically give to them is the way to go. And there's nothing like seeing politicians refuse a gift because that imagery alone can also tell a very different story. Um, any other questions? And Molly, uh, did you have anything else? No, just wanted to thank you so much for sharing your story and the Skillshare with MFN and we will have this posted 
on the YouTube page. So everyone who wasn't able to see it today will get a chance to see it in the future. And I'll put those templates and documents in the resources that we send out to folks as well. So thank you all again so much. There's one more winter MFN Skillshare webinar. It's coming up next week. Uh, from our friends at Push Buffalo and Cooperation Buffalo. They're going to be sharing the amazing work that they have been doing over the last year and a half on mutual aid and setting up mutual aid and the different things that they have learned since creating their mutual aid systems and how that has had a deep resonating impact on the rest of the organizing that Push Buffalo and Cooperation Buffalo have been engaging in. So that's next Tuesday is our last and final MFN Skillshare webinar on mutual aid. We hope to see you there. And again, please share these and begin to follow all of the MFN YouTube uh, channel videos as well. Thank you so much, take care.